Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's talk. Our speaker is Eduardo Saria Vasquez. Eduardo is a senior cryptographer working remotely from Spain for the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi. His research focuses on secure, uh, secure multi-party computation protocols and privacy-preserving verifiable computation. Before joining TII this month, uh, which is March 2021, if you're watching the recording, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the Cryptography and Security Group at Aarhus University. Previous to this, he received his PhD from the University of Bristol, where he was supervised by Professor Nigel Smart. His talk today is on uh, Renokio, Snarks for Ring Arithmetic. Eduardo, it's great to have you. Uh, I will let you take it from here. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jonathan. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, snarks over rings, and this is going to be like a very basic talk. Um, so I don't know how comfortable is everyone in the audience with the topic, so you can tell me to speed up if you want, uh, or you can interrupt me for questions as well. I'm, I'm trying to make, it, to make this very basic, so even if you never came across snarks, if you have some crypto background, you can understand the topic. Um, so let's, let's jump into it. Um, the problem we're, we are dealing with here is that of like a proof system or, or verifiable computation. Um, so you have two parties, a verifier that's going to be Geppetto giving all this talk and a prover that is uh, Pinocchio. So the verifier uh, asks the prover to, to compute some functions and input, and he wants to make sure that the prover did the work. So, you know, the, the prover Pinocchio here will say like, oh yes, I did my homework, right? This is the result of these operations I have to do in my notebook. And now there's, there's two things we want from some sort of proof system, right? We, we want to verify that whether this statement is true or not, or not. So the verifier should be convinced that it is true when it is indeed true. So when Pinocchio did the homework, he must be able to be convinced that Pinocchio did this. Uh, but he also must be able to detect whether Pinocchio uh, did his homework wrong or he didn't do it at all. Uh, so this is what we call like soundness. Okay, so there's different tools one can use uh, for, for this problem and, and what we're using in this work is uh, snarks. So some, some nice properties about snarks, that, um, which are the ones that give the name, uh, are the following. The first one is uh, succinctness. So it has like very small proofs, if you want, it's without getting into more detail. Uh, they are also a non-interactive proof. So rather than having some sort of interrogation between the verifier and the prover, um, we just have the prover send a single message to the verifier and that's all that is needed uh, to execute this protocol. And then there's also, I'm, I'm skipping the AR part, which is argument, which means that this is, you know, like a computational, uh, computationally secure. Uh, and then the K uh, stands for uh, knowledge soundness. So it's not only that we're proving, you know, that Y is F of X, we are, we are really like, uh, there's an extractor that can give you all the intermediate uh, values in the, in the wires of, of the circuit uh, that you're computing. Um, okay, so if we want to talk about this work in a single slide, it, it's the time for stupid jokes. Um, so what we do is like there's all these previous works uh, that do snarks over finite fields, and concretely there's two very important ones that, that I put on the slide. So this is uh, what are known. I will I will refer to this as like GGPR for the top one and as Pinocchio for the second one. Um, th these were very crucial and a lot of snarks nowadays, they, they still follow this kind of pattern that was introduced uh, by these works. So we choose to, to look into these uh, papers and we say like, okay, uh, it would be nice if rather than having these uh, proof statements about circuits uh, where all the wires in the circuit are in a finite field, so the computation happens on a finite field, uh, we do it over a, a ring. So, you know, we take a ring and we put it on Pinocchio. Uh, that's, that's, that's what we do. And uh, if you ask uh, why should you care about doing anything like this, uh, my first answer would be, 
it is nice to look for more general things, right? What, what are the kind of minimal axioms you need in your algebraic structure in order to build a meaningful um, and you know kind of natural uh, proof system over it? And um, it's a nice theoretical question, right? Uh, but other other than this, um, they, there's also like many many applications that actually work over rings rather than finite fields. Um, so for example, if you think about uh, anonymous credentials, machine learning or outsourcing computation, for example, outsourcing computation is nice, but it's even nicer if you outsource computation on encrypted data. Uh, so this is a very difficult problem, um, but you know we need to take steps uh, towards it. So in all of these examples, for example, uh, the, um, in the outsourced computation, if, uh, if we are using like many popular um, homomorphic encryption schemes, they work over some uh, rings um, that are like the product of some polynomial rings. If you wanted to do your anonymous credentials uh, or with uh, some RSA kind of thing, if it's not destroyed, um, then you, you are also working over a finite ring that is not a finite field. And, uh, and kind of in general, I, I took the example of machine learning on, I mean, like you do like uh, some fairness uh, machine learning uh, verification. People tend to represent data as, you know, like it's, it's a string in your computer. You have uh, like a 32 bits or six, 64 bit uh, words, and you do some, some products of this, right? This is how we, how we represent computation uh, in practice most of the times. And actually, if you, if you replace these structures, uh, for example, in machine learning with like a finite field or something like that, there's, uh, you know, we don't know so much. Right, we, we we make tests and we say like, oh, it seems to be still accurate, but we don't really know what we're doing. Right. So if you look at uh, works uh, that precede this one, like Pinocchio, is like, okay, well, I work over a finite field, and uh, and what's more, I mean, it's it's a very valid reason, right? Because uh, you need to use pairings. So these are kind of like two sides of the same coin. In order uh, to use pairings you need uh, to use a finite field that will allow you to, to define these pairings over an elliptic curve and, and so on. So it, it, it's like a two, it's two sides of the same coin. If you want some sort of public verifiability, you want to use pairings and then you are tied uh, to using these uh, very concrete finite fields, prime fields. Um, and still you could, uh, so what you can do is try to, to adapt um, this, all this arithmetic of these rings and emulate it over your finite field. And there's, uh, prior to our work, there's, for example, one, uh, another one on PKC 2020 uh, by Dario Fiore, by Yanka here in the audience, and by uh, David Moncheval, um, who study this issue of like, okay, uh, outsource computation over encrypted data, but they still have to deal with uh, this kind of restriction with the, with the finite field. So what we do is like, we, we decide to, to take a different approach. So rather than adapting, uh, you know, problems to existing snarks, we try to adapt snarks to existing problems. So we want to be able to easily, you know, run all of, the, of these things on the right-hand side over a snark that works over a, a finite ring. Okay. So the contributions uh, in a bit more detail uh, in this work are the following. Uh, first of all, we have a way of representing computation uh, over rings. So these are uh, what we call quadratic ring programs. And you know, I'm putting an asterisk here on you know, the arbitrary part of the commutative rings because it's, it's not all of them, but I'll get into that in a second. Uh, and this is a generalization of previous concepts. So in all of these previous works, they have this notion of a quadratic arithmetic program that worked over a finite field. 
And there's also other works that do like quadratic polynomial programs uh, that work over uh, polynomial rings where the coefficients are on a finite field though, still related to this use of palings. Uh, second, we have our um, a designated verifier SNARK that we build from, from the QRP uh, representation of computation from the, from the previous point. And we do this uh, in some sort of modular way. So we, we just have to represent the computation with a quadratic ring program. Then we find some sort of suitable encoding that you can think of as some linearly homomorphic encryption scheme over the ring on which you want to do the computation, but something that is really only linear. Uh, if it's more than linear, if it allows you to do some multiplication or things like this, it's not going to be a good candidate. And um, I will discuss this uh, at the end of the talk in more detail. And then as, as some example instantiations, uh, we, we take the integers modulo two to the K, um, but this is actually like, we can't directly work over set two to the K, so we, we, have, we have to move over to a ring ext extension. So we move to something that is called a Galois ring. And for those who have never heard about Galois rings, it's the same idea of a Galois field. The name is not uh, by accident. So if you imagine you wanted to work over F2 and you have to move to an extension of degree D of F2 because you don't have enough points, right? For whatever you want to do. Here, the idea is kind of similar. You, you are working over set to the K. This ring will not be good enough for reasons that I will mention later. So you move to this extension. And um, yeah, if you, if you have more, more questions about these rings, uh, we, we can talk later on, but you don't really need to understand more about them. It's just like you move to a bigger ring that has some nicer properties, and there you can do uh, your work. And it's basically like the same construction as you do in, in a field. You move to a polynomial ring and you make some quotient and everything is magic. And then we take another application, which is a very computation over encrypted data. And uh, here we just instantiate this ring with the rings that are used in this uh, learning with errors based uh, homomorphic encryption schemes. Okay, so again, insisting on, on the why should you care, emulating arithmetic is expensive. Not saying much, but yes, uh, it's really like if you go read these papers, if you go read like Pinocchio, uh, one of the biggest sources of overhead is the degree of some polynomial h that the prover has to compute. And the degree of this polynomial is related to the number of multiplication gates in the circuit. And if you have to emulate multiplications in your ring by, by multiplications in the field and then do the modular reduction and so on, you're going to have a lot of multiplication gates. So this is really improving the actual concrete efficiency of these schemes. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the construction and, um, and how we do this. So imagine the task, right, where uh, Pinocchio has to compute some circuit and he wants to convince uh, the verifier that he did this job. So a very easy way to convince the verifier was would be just Telling the telling every value on the on every wire of the circuit the verifier and handing that to him, uh, but that's not a very pleasant kind of proof, right? We we want to have like we said these succinct proofs. Um, so what we are going to do is representing this uh, problem about uh, circuit satisfiability as a polynomial problem. So we are going to have, uh, I'm going to take this dummy circuit as an example. And uh, if you have seen this before, you can tell me I can skip this part, but otherwise I think it's uh, very instructive. Uh, so we, we are going to have like three sets of polynomials, V, W, and Y, and another polynomial, uh, T of X, that we're going to refer to as the target polynomial. And the way we, we are going to represent this problem of, uh, of circuit satisfiability 
is uh, as follows. If the prover can give you a polynomial P of X, such that P of X modulo this target polynomial is zero, then that will mean that uh, he has a valid assignment to the wires of the circuit. So he did the job that was meant to do and the output is really the output that is meant to be. Uh, so, you know, these, these assignments uh, to the circuit are these values C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, okay? Um, so to do this, uh, we will first have to assign some name and some actual like ring element to each of these multiplication gates on the circuit. So I'm circling this with blue here, G1 and G2. Those are two values that we're going to assign to these uh, multiplication gates. And now we can define these polynomials V, W, and Y, okay? So the V polynomials are going to represent left inputs to a certain gate on the circuit. W is for right for, uh, inputs, and Y is for the output wires of, of these multiplication gates. Okay, so if we look at one gate at a time, let's start looking at this gate uh, G1. What we want to do is define this, uh, all these polynomials in these sets by interpolation. And what we want these polynomials to tell us, as I said, is this kind of assignment. So given any wire, we want to know to which gates is it a left input, to which gates it is a, a right input, if it is the output of some gate, or you know anything. So we, we are kind of wiring, assigning the wires to gates by defining these uh, polynomials. So what we want to do is like, we say, okay, for example, for wire three, uh, this is a left input to the gate G1. So we want that the polynomial V3 evaluated at G1 is one. This is how we denote uh, this event. If we look at the wire four, we say, okay, the polynomial uh, W4 evaluated at G1 should evaluate to one. And then same reasoning as wire five is an output of this gate G1, Y5 of G1 should be one. If we look at the gate uh, G2, uh, we will have that this uh, both uh, wire one and wire two are left inputs um, to this multiplication gate. And this might be like less evident, but basically what happens here is that we can deal with uh, addition gates for free. And that is why we define it like this. And then the same for, uh, for the other wires, right? Wire five is an a right input to the gate and wire six is an output to these gates. So we say that this evaluation should be one. And it is very important that we also say uh, if a wire is not an input or an output of any other gate. So for example, uh, wire three uh, is not anything but a left input to G1. So all these polynomials, uh, V3, W3, and Y3 uh, should evaluate to zero for G2, for example. So one, whenever you are related to the gate in, in the way that is specified by the, whether it's VW or Y, zero otherwise. Okay. Is this part clear? I went a bit uh, rushing over it. Okay, no questions? Good. Okay, um, so we have VW and Y representing the left, right, and output wires of, of the gates in the circuit. And, uh, and we want the prover to construct this polynomial P, we said. So how does this polynomial P look like? It's going to be the product of uh, a linear combination of the V polynomials with a linear combination of the W polynomials minus a linear combination of the Y polynomials. 
And the coefficients in these linear combinations are going to be the values on the wires uh, that correspond. So for example, we have uh, the value C1 times the polynomial V1 and so on. And uh, this equation might look a bit exotic, but if you think about the previous um, slide, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? If you evaluate the polynomial P at G1, uh, unless the polynomial, so if we, if we go at polynomial, for example, for the wire three, right? Uh, all the all the V polynomials are going to, to go to zero at G3, but uh, the one, but V3, because V3 is a left input to G3. So all this equation basically is going to simplify. P of G3 is going to be C3 times C4 minus C5. And um, then we have the polynomial T that we didn't talk about it yet, this, this target polynomial. And this is uh, just the product of uh, X minus GJ. So it's a polynomial that has roots on every of the values that we use to define these multiplication roots. And uh, the reason for this, if, if you want to look at why all of this makes sense in a more algebraic way, is uh, it's just the Chinese remainder theorem going on here. So what we have is a polynomial P of X that lives uh, in the polynomials. Uh, so, so rather than looking at the polynomials with coefficients in R, we're going to make a quotient by an ideal defined by this uh, polynomial T of X. And, um, and then if you apply the Chinese uh, remainder theorem twice, you, you can, you know, uh, say that this polynomial P modulo T of X is going to be zero if and only if P evaluated at G1 is zero, P evaluated at G2 is zero and so on for all, the, for all these roots of, of T of X. And here, um, so, so this is, you know, you, you could look at it like individually, right? By just uh, looking at the math from, okay, this is how we defined. Okay, so if we evaluate at this, yeah, this is zero, this is one. So it's really giving me the equation, but you can really define this isomorphism and do this like uh, in full formality. Um, so for those who are more math inclined, might be already like a little bit skeptical about what I'm writing here because this is not fully correct, right? Uh, in order to, to define this isomorphism, we need all of these ideals to be co-prime or, or co-maximal, whatever you want to, to George used to call this. So all of this works fine as long as we have a finite field here, not any uh, finite ring, but a finite field. So this is the reason why all of these previous works uh, of QAPs, this, this is why all of these were like sensible definitions, but now we are over a ring. So it might be that these ideas here are, are not co -prime. And this is where uh, something that we will call exceptional sets uh, are going to help us. So what is an exceptional set? It is a set such that if you take the difference of any two elements on it, it's going to give you a unit. It's going to give you something that is invertible. Okay. So uh, some misconceptions when, when I talk about this to some people is that this is a set. I'm saying that this is just a set. I don't need any further algebraic property. I don't need this to be any subring or anything like that. It's not even like closed under a vision or anything like that. Okay. And uh, the good thing about these uh, exceptional sets is that if you look at these ideals uh, that we had when we applied the, the Chinese remainder theorem, uh, now, if, if, we, if we take this, uh, these roots that we, uh, of the polynomial T that we used to, to define uh, the wiring on the circuit, so these G values, remember, are what we used to define the gates. Now, if you look at these ideals, they are going to be pairwise uh, co-prime. And this is like a one-line proof, right? You, you just uh, make compute this sum here, and you get like a difference between two elements in the, in the exceptional set that's uh, invertible in the ring 
so you can generate all the polynomial ring. And now we can apply the, the Chinese remainder theorem and be happy ever after. So this is how you can define and why you can define quadratic ring programs as long as your ring contains a big enough exceptional set. And uh, okay, yeah, so if we replace uh, math with cute Disney characters, this is how it looks on the, on the previous slide, right? Now you, you replace these uh, G values uh, with your elements from the exceptional set and you can do your quadratic ring uh, program. Okay, so yeah, as if I don't get any questions, I just keep going. I'm also not seeing any faces uh, because of this annoying detail of the, of the black square. So I just keep going. Um, so we, we have a way to represent computation now. We have the quadratic ring programs, but now we want to build the SNARK from, the, from it. Um, okay, so how do we do this? Okay, what one could first thing is this, oh, yeah. Yeah, the prover could just go uh, like, okay, I have the polynomial P that satisfies that P of X modulo T of X equals zero. So there you go, verifier. These are all the coefficients of this polynomial. Um, you know, can you be happy now? And, uh, and not really, right? Because the degree of this polynomial is going to be proportional to the number of multiplication gates in the circuit. So this is uh, this this proof has uh, the size of this proof is is kind of linear uh, on the on the number of yeah it's linear on the number of uh, of gates in the in the multiplication in the in the circuit. So that that's that's not good. And uh, Pinocchio is not happy because he doesn't like to work. Uh, but the verifier has, has a solution for this problem, right? There's this uh, sort simple lemma that, that is going to help us. So if you've, if you've never come across this, it's a very nice, simple trick uh, to test whether a polynomial is the zero polynomial or not. So if your polynomial is not the zero polynomial, and I give you a random point for you to evaluate it. Uh, the evaluation is not going to be zero, much likely. So in a bit more detail, uh, you sample a value S, you evaluate F at, F at S, and the probability that this is going to be equal to zero is going to be less or equal than the degree of the polynomial divided by the size of the space where you're sampling S. So in this case, the whole uh, finite field. So, okay, with this, we can now make like a much succinct uh, proof. So we could think of something like the verifier sends the random value S to the prover. Pinocchio is nice for this time and he really evaluates P at S. Let's say that he does this, right? Uh, so now this is a single element in the ring rather than you know all the coefficients of the polynomial. Uh, but there's several problems here, right? This sort of simple lemma, as I gave it to you on the slide, it's defined over finite fields, not over rings. But it turns out that as long as you sample this random point from an exceptional set, once again. Uh, this lemma generalizes fine uh, to rings. So you can have a polynomial with coefficients on a ring and you sample the random point from the exceptional set. And now the probability is going to be smaller than the degree of the, the polynomial divided by the size of the exceptional set. Okay, so this is the first uh, problematic thing. Second problematic thing is that we, this is succinct, but it is interactive now. We have the verifier send a message to the prover and the prover replying to that. And we only wanted a single message going from the prover to the verifier. So how can we fix this? We are going to introduce some uh, common reference string. So how does this look like? I'm simplifying things here, and um, I hope it's understandable. 
So this uh, common reference string is going to contain uh, encodings of the polynomials on the sets V, W, and Y evaluated at S. So we take the polynomials on the sets V, W, and Y, we evaluate them on S, at S, and then we encode them. And if you, if you remember this encoding, you can think about it as something like a linearly homomorphic encryption over the ring that we are working. So what we want the prover to provide us now is like an encoding of, uh, of this polynomial evaluated at S rather than the polynomial in the clear. So that, let's, let's get into that. In, there's, there's still a couple of caveats, but we get into them very quickly. So the prover has to construct this uh, encoding of P of S. So how would this look like? If we define this first parenthesis uh, here as like V of S, uh, the, the sum and on the second uh, parenthesis as uh, W of S, and the third one as Y of S, um, this is how uh, P of S looks like. Uh, but from the CRS, the prover is not really able to compute the encoding of P of S, right? Because we said that we want this encoding to be linearly homomorphic but we don't want this encoding to allow for any multiplication. So rather than giving uh, a single encoding, encoding of P of S, what the prover is going to give uh, to the verifier is like the encoding of B of S, the encoding of W of S, and the encoding of Y of S. And uh, again, if you keep thinking about instantiating this encoding as uh, a linear homomorphic encryption scheme, then the verifier can just you know, decrypt these three encodings, compute the product P of S, and, and do this, and see if whether this is uh, zero or not. OK. So yeah, and as, as I have been kind of uh, saying over the slide, what's important here is that this encoding only allows us to do linear combinations. So we are able to compute the encoding of V of S from the values on the CRS from this uh, set V hat, but we can't try to do anything farther than that as a proof of it. Um, so I have simplified things a lot there uh, on the slide because I, I tried um, that even if you never uh, came across the snarks, you, you understand why this work. Like, okay, this is the sort of lemma, this is how you make it non-interactive and so on. Uh, so for those that are a bit more familiar with, uh, with the area, I have some, uh, some notes here. So one, one, one thing in our work is that uh, the proof uh, size is nine ring elements uh, rather than eight as one could think which is what happens in, in, for example, Pinocchio that works on over fields. And the reason for this is that uh, they can do with one element less in the proof uh, because they can, so there is uh, the way you, I also simplified like uh, to, to make like nicer, to make the math argument like easier to see. So they don't really work over a quotient ring. Uh, they don't really take uh, the quotient by uh, the target polynomial. They just work over the over the whole ring directly. So what they do in order to prove that p of x modulo t of x equals zero is providing a polynomial h of x such that h of x times t of x equals uh, p of x, right? Well, of s at this time because we are evaluating it. Um, so. Uh, in order to do extraction, if you're familiar with these works, what you do is that you multiply all these elements in your, uh, in your proof with some coefficient alpha so that you can invoke some uh, PKE assumption to, to extract, to get the knowledge uh, soundness. And they are able to, to compute this polynomial H with, without going down that road because of, uh, they are able to like compute directly using pairings, this encoding. Also, I have been saying all the time things like, oh, if you assume that the encoding is like something that is linear only, linear only. Uh, so if you are also 
familiar with this literature, you might know about this kind of linear only extractable assumptions. But this is not what we assume really. Uh, in our work, we assume something that is uh, provably weaker, that we, uh, we prove that is weaker, which are these assumptions, uh, a generalization of existing assumptions in the GGPR. So we have a generalized uh, PKE assumption and uh, generalized uh, PDH assumption. And I'll talk a bit about this PDH assumption in the, in the next slide, because I think it's uh, very instructive as well. And, you know, generally through the paper, you need to be careful about uh, the main issue you have when you work over rings rather than finite fields, which is that you have zero divisors. And if you look away for a second, they will come bite you in the face. So uh, this, this introduces several problems. And in particular, because we want to provide a result that is as general as possible. And even though, you know, if, if you if you introduce more and more restrictions, you, you can get uh, more properties, but we, we, we give little properties so that it's easy to instantiate. So for this reason, for example, we don't, pro uh, we don't proof our SNARK to have strong soundness. Uh, why? Because if you give the prover access to some verification oracle, uh, by querying this oracle, these zero devices can allow you to extract information little by little in some cases, not in every case, in some cases, but you know, we want to be general and easy to instantiate. It is interesting to look into particular rules. This is like a first kind of working with it. Okay, so the QPDH assumption. Um, on the left-hand side here, I will show you how it looks for finite fields. So basically, uh, the cheating prover is, is giving um, uh, all these encodings of powers of S, which is a random element on the finite field, in this case, or the units of the finite field. And uh, he's giving uh, powers from one to two Q, but he's missing uh, the power Q plus one. And, uh, and the way the adversary wins here is if given this, uh, you know what we have in the orange envelopes, he's able to compute an encoding of the Q plus one power of S. Okay. And uh, how, how we generalize this to the ring setting, I think it's, uh, it's interesting. So for example, rather than sampling S from the field, we are going to sample it from an exceptional set, actually from an exceptional set such that all the elements of the set are units themselves to start with. Remember that this set just asks that the differences are invertible, but it doesn't say that whether the elements are invertible or not. But it's very simple um, to get an exceptional set where every element is a unit themselves from the other one. It's really like by reducing in one the number of elements. So well, first this. Um, the reason for that, well, the, the reason for it being a unit, you know, is because uh, we are computing all these powers. So if it's a zero divisor, it's it's a finite ring. So it's even worse. It's going to be like nil. Um, so we don't want that. And, uh, and also it has to be a member of the exceptional uh, set because uh, of what we were saying earlier, at some point we are going to like, in the proof, in the reduction, we are going to call the sword simple lemma somehow. So then we need to, to sample S from the exceptional set. Okay. Uh, so what does the adversary need to do now? Uh, we say that it is good enough for the adversary to come up with an encoding of the Q plus one power of S times any coefficient A of his choice, as long as this coefficient is not zero, because, you know, encoding of zero. Okay, I just, I just give you zero. Um, and we think that this is essentially, this is like the right way to generalize this assumption because it basically, uh, translates the same idea, right? If, if, if 
if, uh, if the adversary is able to provide you with this, he, he knows SQ plus one somehow, which he shouldn't, right? He, he's able to compute SQ plus one somehow, which he shouldn't. And actually, if, if you substitute here on the right hand, right -hand side, uh, the ring with a field, you recover what is on the left hand side. Because if the adversary is able to provide you an encoding of any A of his choice times SQ plus one, he can just multiply this by the inverse of A as well. And he recovers an encoding of S to the Q plus one. So it's really, you know, in the field case, these two are really equivalent. It's a, it's a true generalization. Okay. Um, so yeah, as I said, this, this coefficient can be chosen by the adversary. And, and what uh, what's a power for the adversary here somehow is that he can choose this to be a zero divisor, but still we, we are able to, to prove security in this case. So, so that's about the, um, the SNARK construction, right? We, we reviewed how we define the quadratic ring program how we do the snark from the quadratic ring program. And now we can talk about how to instantiate it. So we have two instantiations. And the first one is for the integers modulo two to the k. And the problem here is that we don't have exceptional sets of size bigger than two for the integers modulo two to the k. Why? If you give me any three elements, uh, for the integers modulo two to the k. The difference, there's going to be a difference between two of them that is going to be even. And any multiple of two is a zero divisor. So that's why. The solution uh, to this problem is uh, to move to this uh, Galois ring, which is a Galois extension of, uh, of the integers uh, modulo two to the k. And as I said, you don't really need to know much about, uh, about this. The only thing that you need to know is that by doing this, we can now find on this Galois ring an exceptional set of size two to the D. So by, by moving to a big enough extension, we can get exceptional sets as big as we want. And uh, of course, this also, it's reasonable to say, okay, Eduardo, but now this, uh, this has like a heavier computation, right? Uh, you're, uh, you're working over, your arithmetic is over the Galois ring, it's not over the integers modulo two to the k. But you know, these are like polynomials over set two to the k. It's, uh, it's, as, it's as reasonable as, as of an overhead as moving to an extension field when you're in, an, in another field. Uh, but in any case, uh, we also show in the paper how to do some parallel repetition of our SNARK construction in such a way uh, that you only need to be on a very small degree uh, extension of the integers modulo two to the k. And you do several proofs over this uh, small degree extension and you get the same soundness. So there, there's, uh, there's things that you can do here. And also like you, you can also do like uh, FFT kind of techniques over the Galois ring. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's not as bad as, it's not so bad. It's, it has an overhead, but you know, it's not so bad. There, there's ways around it. Um, and then, okay, what, what's the encoding uh, we use here? So, um, what we do is, as I said, this, this color ring, you can look at it as like polynomials with coefficients on the integers modulo two to the k. So what we do is uh, define the encoding of an element of the color ring by encoding each of the coefficients of this polynomial. So we see an element A um, as, as the, uh, the encoding of an element A as an encryption of each of these coefficients of A seen as a polynomial over set to K. And this is like a, a set to K linearly homomorphic scheme. So as I said, this is kind of what we want. Um, the second application that we have in the paper is uh, verifiable computation over encrypted data. 
So what, what we do here is that we instantiate our CK snark. Uh, I, I kind of uh, glossed through that, but our snark can basically make zero knowledge as well uh, in the same way as you do in Pinocchio and so on. There's, uh, there's no complication there. And, um, and here, okay, so what's the ring that we're using here to instantiate it? As I said, this is like uh, some product uh, if, of, um, we have like a, a polynomial uh, ring that looks like the one on the screen where Q is a, a product of primes. So as long as the first, you know, the smallest of these primes is big enough, you're, you're happy to, to work directly over, over this ring because the exceptional set is going to have size, you know, the, as big as the prime. Not the size of the prime, you know, like as many elements as the prime. Um, if your smallest prime here wouldn't be big enough, you can also move to some extension and do, or rather than doing that, do some parallel repetition and so on, as on the previous slide. And uh, the comparison here, what, what's nice about this approach is again, if you compare with this uh, PKC paper from 2020, where they do snarks uh, over uh, encrypted data as well, is that we have more freedom to choose this value Q because there they have to uh, use pairings and so on. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the advantage. Now, now we, can, we, we have more freedom to choose the parameters for these homomorphic encryption schemes, which is really like a tough task. And the efficiency really uh, deteriorates if, if you restrict this freedom. Um, and also uh, we can use like techniques like uh, plain text packing and modulo switching and so on. On the other hand, compared with that work, we are only designated verifier. They are public verifier. And as I said at the beginning of the talk, these are two sides of the same coin. If you want public verifiability, you will have to use pairings and that's going to restrict uh, the arithmetic uh, that you can use. And uh, yeah, in order to do the zero knowledge part, we can adapt uh, these context hiding techniques that, that they propose in this work there, because you have to be careful about, um, about what do you give in these encodings to the very value. So in conclusion, uh, this, what we do in this work uh, is the SNARKs over rings and emulating ring arithmetic on SNARKs is otherwise uh, very expensive if you do it over a kind of field. Uh, the way around this problem is using these exceptional sets that maybe surprisingly are like the main tool that you need that you don't need. Uh, so yeah, just with that, you can do many things somehow. And uh, all for these efficiency considerations, we, we also propose like way to do like uh, parallel um, uh, repetitions to amplify soundness and reduce this cost of moving to like uh, extension rings when you cannot find a big enough exceptional set in your starting ring. So, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll gladly uh, answer any questions. Thank you. So thank you, Eduardo, for that, that fantastic talk. Our next talk is uh, this coming Tuesday, March 16th at 1700 UTC. Uh, if you're in the US, don't forget that the time change will be uh, March 14th this Sunday. Uh, so the talk will be at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, as opposed to what it uh, the, that same time is this week. Uh, anyway, the talk is from Luisa Siniscalci. Uh, we'll find out next week how I pronounce that. Um, a postdoctoral researcher in cryptography at the University of Salerno. Her talk will be how to extract useful randomness from unreliable sources. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and share this video. If you want to hear about future talks, research funding opportunities, or general updates on Protocol Labs research, please join our mailing list in the footer at research.protocol.ai. Thanks for joining everyone. We will see you next time. <laughs>